Good morning, Desert Springs Church. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good morning, Desert Springs Church. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Choir is here, and uh, we'd love to share a couple of songs with you that just really touched our hearts this week. Um, the first one is called Awesome in This Place. And think about that. He is awesome in this place. Not that other place, this place. Which means wherever we are at, since we have the Lord in our heart, he's there with us. So he's awesome in this place.
Oh, my goodness. Whew. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this next song is called Psalm 100. And I wanted to read you. It's a, it's a short psalm. So it says, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations.
Well, once again, y'all, happy Sunday. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope that everybody is uh, being blessed. Uh, today is kind of a bittersweet, sad day for the worship team. Our very own Rebecca, this will be her uh, last Sunday with us. Yeah, so uh, pray for her and her wonderful family. And Rebecca, you know, we all love you. We're going to miss you dearly. So I'm going to get out of the driver's seat. And brothers and sisters, Rebecca Hawkins. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun said He has ransomed me, his grace comes deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died. So this next one would have really done better as an Easter song, but seeing as how I will not be here for Easter with you guys, I figured I would uh, share this with you this morning. It's called Ain't No Grave. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. 
Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no smooth and velvet tongue fear is a tyrant he's always telling me to run oh love's a resurrection lifting me up from the ground love is my weapon i'm gonna take my giants down there ain't no War between death and life There on a tree The Lamb of God was crucified Well, he went on down to hell And he took back every key He rose up like a lion And he's setting all the captives free There ain't no Welcome to Desert Springs. This is Pastor Colin. If this is your first day with us, please stop by the Connecting Place counter. We have a gift for you, and thank you for coming. Today is the last day you can sign up for the musical Jericho, the sweeping biblical story of Joshua and Rahab. Jericho is being put on by Lifehouse Theater in Redlands on Saturday, April 2nd. The cost of tickets is $45 per person, which includes the play, and your seat upon a cart of coach traveling to and from the event from Desert Springs. Once again, the last day to buy tickets is today. Please see Dean Gatons or visit the table in the lobby following service. Desert Springs Church needs you to consider joining our worship choir. You don't have to read music or be a professional singer. If you can carry a tune, learn your part, and commit yourself to rehearsals and performances, this might be the ministry for you. Choir rehearses Tuesday nights from 6 to 8 p.m., sings two times per month in all services, likewise does special concerts for Christmas and Easter. If this sounds interesting or you feel God's calling, 
then please see our choir director, Terry Griffin, or contact the church office for more information. We look forward to hearing your gift. Coming this August, Desert Springs Church is headed to Baja, California for a week-long mission trip. If God has been encouraging you to do something bigger for His kingdom, please plan on joining our Mexico missions meeting in the family room Sunday, March 20th, following our third service. This will be an information meeting to answer questions and begin preparing for our August departure. Once again, that's Sunday, March 20th, following third service for the Mexico missions meeting. Finally, thank you for your loving gifts and your tithes and offerings. We really appreciate your generous support. You can leave your offering as you exit service with one of the ushers at the doors. If you want to know what's going on at Desert Springs Church, check your program or visit us online at visitdsc.org for everything else that's happening. Thanks for joining us online here at Desert Springs Church in Palm Desert. And uh, we're so glad you're with us. We're back in the book of 1 Samuel. We've been in the book of 1 Samuel for quite a long time now, so thanks for hanging on with us. We're almost there. This is going to be week number 20, just two more weeks to go. Watch my lips. Two more weeks and we will have gone through the entire book of 1 Samuel together. Then we're going to go into some other uh, topics and sections of the Bible throughout the rest of the spring and the summer season. And then God willing, we'll go into the book of 2 Samuel uh, beginning sometime next fall. Now, uh, you may be online with us for worship uh, because you're at a great distance from where we are here in Palm Desert, or maybe you're concerned about your health. God bless you, hope you stay healthy. Whatever the reason, uh, we're just glad that remotely you're still part of the church family. And if you're just visiting, watching here online, uh, welcome to the church family here at Desert Springs Church. We're so glad that you've joined us. And God's Word, the Bible, always has great things to say for our lives, to help us, to encourage us, to straighten our course in life, to get us going strong in a way that will bless and help us and others in life. So keep applying the Bible to your life, will you? And you'll be glad that you did. As always, uh, you can give to help support the ministry. Just click that large round button, mark ties and offerings right here on the main page at visitdsc.org. And if you have a prayer request, we would be glad to pray for you. And we have a prayer team. Uh, email us here. All the information is at the bottom of our main page here at visitdsc.org. Or you can call our church office. Let us know. And we will pray for your prayer need as well. God tells us, hey, pray, ask of him. And so we want to do that for you. And then finally, I want to say a super big thank you. Uh, this past Sunday, we did a surprise uh, offering live here at the church uh, to help those in Ukraine uh, struggling. And uh, it was an offering for the churches in Ukraine. They're feeding people in the communities who are still there. And uh, keep praying for Ukraine, will you? And uh, God was good. Uh, the church gave over $11,000 in that offering. And so all that money is gone now to uh, help provide relief through the churches in Ukraine. Uh, and again, they're all using those funds to help feed the people in the communities there around that amazing country. Pray for them, will you? And then we've been having an offering to help the Refuge Pregnancy Center here in our valley uh, to give uh, unplanned pregnancies hope uh, and the importance of a uh, uh, bearing that precious child that God gave them, whether they choose to keep the baby or offer the baby up for a good, uh, wonderful home after the baby's born. And, and our church gave over 11,000, no, I'm sorry, over 10,000 for that one. So uh, praise God, pray for the Refuge Pregnancy Center, will you? And thank you to all those in our church family, so many in our church who volunteer and help out in that great ministry. All right, well, it's time for week number 20 together, and if you want to use the message notes, as always, they're available there online. Just look on the main page. You'll see where it says uh, message notes for this Sunday, March 13. You can click on that link. Uh, you can see the notes, download them, print them out, and follow along with us if you like. Uh, if you have a Bible handy, open it up, will you, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26. We're going to look at this entire chapter together. Our topic is led astray, led astray. And let me ask you, have you ever gotten lost? Have you ever had bad directions? You thought you were headed the right way, and later you learned, no, you were going the wrong way. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I can relate. 
uh, I have absolutely no natural sense of direction whatsoever. And um, it, it's the truth. Uh, if there were fog, I could literally get lost in a parking lot. And I'm not kidding. I recently discovered that uh, my car, my SUV, actually does have uh, a little directional locator right on the little screen. And it gives me an N for north, S for south, etc. And so I got super excited when I just discovered that recently uh, because, boy, I certainly use it. And uh, I think the biggest adventure of our cross-country trip that my wife and I took uh, last summer uh, to visit family across the U.S. was that we actually made it back successfully. She was having to correct me all the time. And uh, it's true. Uh, God bless my wife, especially for navigating me out of the cornfields of North Dakota. And that's a true story. So uh, going astray is something we are all susceptible to. Certainly, I can do it geographically, but you know, the Bible's talking about the warning of being led astray in our lives spiritually. And when we're led astray spiritually, it impacts our behavior and how we are led astray in our own actions and the outcome of our lives. So it's an important thing to guard against and to seek remedy for. Uh, all it takes to go the wrong way in life is to be diverted from going the right way. Hence, our subject led astray. Uh, this is why Jesus said, abide in me and follow me and remain in me. When we come to faith in the Lord Jesus, we find the right direction for uh, living uh, our lives, our lives new in the Lord Jesus. Now, as we've come to believe in Christ, we need to continue going the right direction. And so our message title denotes that uh, it's possible to get off track, to get off course, to get into the weeds, even onto the precipice, and sadly, even over the cliff of life. Believer, don't be led astray. Uh, Saul was led astray time and time and time again. And his life revealed the outcome of a wayward soul. So let me ask you right now, who are the influencers of your life? What weaknesses must you guard against? These are important questions to honestly consider and answer for ourselves. In chapter 26, verse 1, we find the starting point for going astray in life. And uh, if you're using your notes, jot down on that first blank the word misguidance. Misguidance. 1 Samuel 26, verse 1. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding on the hill of uh, Hakalah? which is before Jeshimon. Misguidance in our lives comes through many forms. We can get some bad advice. There could be a tempting suggestion. Poor practices in our lives can lead us astray. You can even be misguided by Christian friends or your favorite pastor. It's true. It's not just what each of us say, it's also what we do, how we live, what we stand for. Everything makes an impact on others. And remember, you will become who you follow after in life. So evaluate who you will take your cues from in life and don't become misguided. Take Saul, for instance, and I know it can sound like I'm picking on Saul, but I want to tell you, sadly, uh, time and again, he reveals uh, a methodology in his thinking and in his decision-making that is very poor, and uh, we're all susceptible to it, so it's not about looking down on him, but it's about learning from his poor decision-making. 
uh, we see as chapter 26 opens uh, another one of the real life experiences that he went through. Now, do you think for a moment that the Ziphites actually cared about Saul, uh, about what was best for him, or uh, what would be right for his life, what God wanted him to do? No, of course not. Uh, what did the Ziphites uh, want? They, I believe, wanted the favor of the king for themselves. Uh, they were interested in how to win the king's favor. And uh, so uh, they wanted to offer Saul his murderous prize of being able to kill David so that they could get what they wanted from the king. You know, kind of like, we'll do you a favor, king, and I'm sure the day would quickly come where they would want the king to do them an equal quality of favor for them. Uh, misguidance tends to come from misguided motives. I'm going to say it again. Misguidance tends to come from misguided motives. So be careful, believer, that advice you give uh, may seem genuine and right, but, but search your heart before you give it to someone. Lord, am I offering that with uh, your will in mind? Am I offering this advice according to what would be best for the other person? See, advice impacts people's lives. That should all strike a very serious chord within every one of our hearts and minds. You know, uh, there are times when people open up and they want to know what we think. That's a time to be prayerful and to be humble before the Lord and say, God, what should I share with them? Because you see, they may just take your advice. It may influence the course of their life. So let me ask you, what was the last time you got some really lousy advice in life? Hmm, a poor recommendation or some wrong influence. I can tell you, I get bad advice all the time. Uh, it might be on this commercial or on the cover of that magazine advertisement. It might come at me through popular media or through current cultural trends. It is not hard to get bad advice thrown your direction. And often it is packaged very nicely. Now we see in verses 2 to 4 what I would describe as taking the bait. Taking the bait. So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having with him 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul camped in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon beside the road, and David was staying in the wilderness. David sent out spies, and he knew that Saul was definitely coming. We're going to pause there, talk about it for a moment. So Saul takes the bait of this bad advice from the Ziphites. Remember, our last time together, uh, if you were with us last week, and uh, you can always watch that message online uh, if, uh, uh, if you missed it. But Saul just got done repenting of saying, David, you're right, I shouldn't have tried to kill you. And uh, Saul went back to his home, and uh, David continued to hide out in the, the hill country. Uh, because he was concerned that maybe Saul would start hunting him again. Here we go, the next chapter, and Saul's hunting him again. Saul takes the bait of bad advice. He quits doing what God wants him to do, which is leave David alone, and he's back to wanting to kill David again. So Saul takes the bait, and he falls to this temptation to, to hunt down and want to kill God's man, David. And Saul knows better, but his unconfessed hatred of God's favor upon David and his jealousy of David's anointing role as the next king of Israel, along with his selfish desire, I believe, for power and control, all form this evil lust within Saul. And he now acts again upon it. Uh, we read in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth 
death. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is why Jesus, God's Son, came to die on the cross, to shed His blood, to be our sacrifice for sin, so we could be forgiven for the things we've done against God. That's what sin is. It's disobeying your Creator God, going against Him in life. And the Bible says we've all done it, and we all need the Savior, Jesus Christ, who alone provided the sacrifice so we could be forgiven by a holy, perfect God. Now, contrast this bad behavior with that of David, who is guarding his steps and watching his way at this point in his life, entrusting himself to the Lord for his own protection and care. And that's the way we're called to live. Now we see in verses 5 to 8 what I would describe as sin's destination. Sin's destination. David then arose and came to the place where Saul had camped. And David saw the place where Saul lay. And Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army, and Saul was lying in the circle of the camp, and the people were camped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeruah, Joab's brother, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the people were lying around him. Then Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now, therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him the second time. Abishai is saying, Shh. This is the perfect situation. Saul's laying there. There's his spear. I can do him in with one quick jab. Well, sin takes us to the wrong place at the wrong time. This is uh, easily illustrated in so many ways. Immorality, it, it's being, uh, if you're a guy being with, with a, a lady, and in our culture today, it can go uh, anyone being with another person outside of that commitment of marriage between one man and one woman. And that's what God wants us to do, to wait and be in the right timing for things. So you can even have the right situation, but if you do it the wrong way, it's still sin, the Bible says. Now, that's not for me to decide. I don't get to vote on that. That's what God says in His Word, the Bible. So you get a Bible, crack it open, that's what it says. And uh, that's what God tells us. And Saul's sin is now bringing him within a millimeter of death. I'm trying to figure out how to make a millimeter for you. It's so slight, it's hard to even uh, give the example. The point is, Saul should never have been out there uh, seeking David's life again. And now David has the opportunity to kill Saul once and for all. And uh, Saul is completely clueless about it. He's sound asleep. See, misguidance in our lives is something we're often clueless about. We're sound asleep as we're going against God in life. And sometimes we're sound asleep uh, through a bad influence or bad influencer in our lives. And um, uh, we, we uh, are in an environment that encourages us to live against God, or there's an opportunity that presents itself for us to go against God in His ways. And, and this is a great time to talk about God's grace. And uh, that's what verses 9 to 12 are about, God's grace. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? So David responds the same way as he did uh, just previously here in the book of 1 Samuel, where he had a chance to kill King Saul in the cave, remember? And David refused to do it. Again, uh, David respects that the Bible says, don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. This is the king of Israel, whether Saul's a good king or not. David also said, as the Lord lives, 
surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come that he dies, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now please take the spear that is at his head and jug of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water from beside Saul's head and they went away, but no one saw or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a sound sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Now it's interesting to note there, did you catch that? Uh, as I just read, that David said to Abishai, take the spear and the, and the jug, but obviously then the Bible says immediately that David was the one who took the spear and the jug. You say, well Mark, is that a mistake? No. What it tells us is that uh, there was no time to quarrel with Abishai. Abishai still obviously wanted to kill Saul, but David wouldn't let him. David was in charge. And uh, uh, so David ended up having to pick up the spear and the jug himself. And you know, sometimes those close to us in life will still be in favor of the misguided advice they give us even when we don't take it. Sometimes you stand alone in doing what's right. Believer, do what's right anyway. Do what's right anyway. And David was choosing the higher ground. Have you ever had someone insult you, give you a hard time, uh, uh, do something bad against you, and you just kind of want to get them back? And God wants us instead to respond by going with the higher ground, forgiving, blessing, helping, uh, not taking advantage of the opportunity when it comes to us. This is called God's grace. See, if I got what I deserved, because I've done a lot of things wrong in my life, let's be honest. And I know this is going out over the internet, so I just want to make clear, I have no right to point my finger at anybody else to say, well, you're a bad person, and I'm not. Because you know what? I'm just a sinner saved by God's grace. And the only reason I can be forgiven, it's not because I'm a pastor, it's not because I do try to do some good things, it's because God gave his son Jesus to forgive me and Jesus died on the cross in my place so I could be forgiven. I don't deserve that. I haven't earned it. There's nothing good I could do right to make up for all the wrong I've done. See, the Bible makes clear we're all sinners. And so we can't go around with our noses up acting like someone's worse than us. And David understood the truth of God's word and he respected that Saul was king and that God's word said don't harm those in authority over you. And so David respected that. David trusted God as his source in life and he responds to Abishai there in the middle of the night with God's advice and that's how we respond to misguidance. We read the Word of God, we study what God says, and we say, wait a minute, that's not what God wants. I'm going to do it God's way. Then we see, I believe next, what I would call righteous reasoning. Righteous reasoning. And David did not say to Abishai, hey, makes sense to me, go ahead and kill the guy. No, righteous reasoning is looking at things from God's Word, the Bible, God's holy perspective, which is always right and which is always true. God's view is the true view. And that's what David did. So we read, picking up, beginning in verse 13 through verse 20, Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the mountain at a distance with a large area between them. David called to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, and remember, Abner's the head of, of, the, of the army for King Saul, and said, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord, the king? For one of the people came to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, all of you must surely die because you did not guard your Lord, the Lord's anointed. So David's saying, you did a lousy job. You didn't even protect King Saul. Someone was just in your camp who wanted to kill him. That would be Abishai, but David doesn't point out the name of the guy. And now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was at his head, verse 17. Then Saul recognized David's voice and said, 
Is this your voice, my son, David? So Saul acknowledges David here out loud in front of the camp, his army of 3,000 men, that David is his son-in-law. He's in family relationship with him. And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, the king. He also said, why then is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my Lord, the king, listen to the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is men, cursed are they before the Lord, for they have driven me out today so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now then, do not let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, just as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. So David humbly says, what am I? Just a flea, a little partridge in the mountains. And then he curses the Ziphites for misguiding King Saul to come and hunt for his life again. So David's uh, godly wisdom is directing him in what to do in this very a tenuous situation. Uh, and uh, I pray that you, believer, will seek godly wisdom for your life as well. You see, when we face one of these situations in life, that's not when you go searching for wisdom. You need to store up godly wisdom in advance so you're ready to draw on it when you will need it in the future. And godly wisdom will always serve you well. And David puts uh, Abner, the head of Saul's army, in his place, and he uh, extends respect to the nation's king, King Saul, and then he humbly pleads his righteous case. And uh, you know, what I would call that is righteous reasoning. And then we find in verses 21 to 25, true confession. And this is what I would long for in my life before God. And I'd long for it for all of us as we love the Lord and live for Him. Just coming clean with God, admitting our sinfulness and saying, God, forgive me. I've gone astray. I've been misguided. Would you help me? This is frankly what Saul needed to do. Just get right with his God. And uh, it just seems that Saul has this real struggle of ever really turning his life fully over to the Lord. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for, for I will not harm you again, because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. David replied, Behold, the spear of the king. Now let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I refused to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now behold, as your life was highly valued in my sight this day, so may my life be highly valued in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me from all distress. Verse 25, Then Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son David. You will both accomplish much and surely prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Well, as we wrap up our chapter now in 1 Samuel, I would remind us that true confession before God includes at least three things. First, an open admission of our sinfulness. In other words, rather than excusing or redefining what we've done wrong, just saying, God, I take ownership of it. I was wrong. And that's what confessing sin before God is all about. Secondly, it's about turning from our sin, agreeing with God that He's right and we were wrong. Uh, I think of, of kids on the playground and one bops the other and the teacher says, tell him you're sorry. And the kid says, I'm sorry. Well, you know what? That's not being sorry. That's just technically saying the words so you get off the hook. 
So it's not only confessing to God we've sinned, but it's agreeing with God as well that it was wrong and being willing to correct that behavior in our lives willingly. And then thirdly, it's about now deciding to abide in God's will and His ways. In other words, obeying the Lord and saying, God, I'll go your way instead of my wrong way. That brings us to our takeout verse of the week. You may want to jot this down. Great verse on our topic together, 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Believer, listen to me. As we wrap up right now, please don't let anyone or anything in any situation veer you off course from your relationship in life with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Keep living for Jesus no matter what. If you have to lose your job over it, let the job go. If you have to give up money to have a right relationship with the Lord, let the money go. If you have to lose a friendship over it, lose the friendship, but don't lose your relationship with Christ. Follow the Lord no matter what. Remember God's grace upon your life. Extend grace to others because we're all sinners and Jesus came so we could be saved from it. And understand that in the struggle of living, so many want to misguide us and point us in the wrong direction. The only way to get it right is confess it to the Lord, agree with God that He's right, we were wrong, recommit ourselves to obeying God in our lives, and then studying His Word, the Bible, so we can get this thing right. Well, where will you and I end up in life? In just two more uh, times together, we're going to see where Saul ended up in life. And uh, it's a sad thing. Uh, I can tell you where we end up in life is entirely based on our decisions. The most powerful ability God has given to you and to me is the power to personally decide, to determine, to set our course of action. So decide well, believer. Decide well. Turn your life completely over to God. And don't let anyone or anything lead you astray from the Lord Jesus and His way. Would you bow with me? We'll pray together. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love for us. And today, God, we confess that, Lord, we've sinned against you. We've gone against you so many times, not only in deed, but in thoughts and in desires. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to be all out for you. Thank you, God, for your grace and your forgiveness. And today, Lord, for every one of us who has accepted you, Jesus, into our hearts as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and and Lord, receive your forgiveness because we believe you are the Son of God. Lord, we thank you so much. And Lord, we just pray you would help us to stay pointed the right direction in you, to live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and to follow you faithfully through thick and thin. Now, if you're viewing right now and you don't know you've ever invited Jesus in your life, this is your chance. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. That's in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 55, verse 6. This is your chance to say yes to the Lord Jesus. Knowing the Lord isn't about religion. It's about having a relationship with him. And you know, God loves you so much, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Only a righteous sacrifice could pay the price of our sin. And so God gave His perfect Son to die on the cross for us. The Bible says after Jesus died, He was buried, and three days later He rose from the dead alive, demonstrating He is God, and the price of our sin has been fully paid. You can accept Jesus to forgive you of everything in your life and to be sure of heaven simply by inviting him in your life now and turning your life over to him. If you're ready to do that, talk to the Lord right now. He's listening. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Use that power of decision God has given you to make the best decision of your life for all eternity. 
Just pray now and say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you're God's only Son. I believe you died for my sins on the cross and you rose from the dead so I can live with you forever in heaven. Thank you for dying for me. Please forgive me of everything and come into my life right now. I'm willing to turn from my old ways to live for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, God bless you if you've made that decision. And uh, contact us. You can email us uh, or you can give our church office a call. Right here, all the information is at the bottom of the main page here at visitdsc.org. I have a little booklet I've written to help you in living for the Lord. No obligation. We're not going to send you anything else or put you on a list. Just give you that little booklet to help you as you start living for the Lord. And keep joining us each weekend here at visitdsc.org, uh, our online worship ministry of Desert Springs Church, Palm Desert. God bless you. Stay encouraged in the Lord. And see you next weekend.